Welcome to Anatomy and Physiology at Glen Oaks Community College. I'm Dr. Ren Hartung. For this video, I'd like to start looking at the skin um, or the integumentary system. And the way, to, the way I start every system is say, well, what, what is this system? And exactly why do we have one? The integumentary system basically is the skin, of course. And you could say it's accessory structures or it's other accessory organs. I like to say accessory organs. The skin is an epithelial tissue, but underneath it's also a connective tissue. Um, there's three major layers to the skin. The epidermis, which is the part that you can actually touch. It's the actual surface of the skin. It's a stratified squamous epithelium. Multiple layers of flattened cells, all dead and flat on the top. Um, underneath of that epidermis is the dermal layer of skin, and that's actually dense, irregular connective tissue for the most part. And then underneath that, which I consider the third layer of the skin, is the subcutaneous layer. Now, most anatomists don't actually consider that a third layer. Um, for them, the skin stops at the dermal layer, and underneath that is the underlying connective tissues like um, adipose tissue, mostly. I still keep the old school three layers up, but anyway. Um, either way, you still know those layers. The accessory organs include things like fingernails and hair and sweat glands and um, oil glands or sebaceous glands. Those are the accessory organs. So that's what the skin is. What it is. Um, So you could say what it is, it's the skin and its accessory organs made up of three layers, epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Hypodermis is also, um, oh, what was the other term? Epidermis, hypodermis, and subcutaneous, subcutaneous layer. So. Again, that's what it is. Um, you could also include in here, of course, accessory structures. Hair, nails, um, and glands. And then under glands, sweat glands and oil glands. And all of this again is what it is. Now why do we have one? multiple answers for this one, but skin itself is a barrier. That's one of its major jobs is just to be a barrier. It separates the inside of the body from the outside of the body. And in that barrier role, it prevents dehydration. Another thing you can put under preventing dehydration is that it helps to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance. One of the reasons I like to stress this is if you have a person who's had a severe burn to their body affecting more than say 20 percent of their skin and effectively destroying over 20 percent of their skin one of the major concerns we have with these severe burn victims is water and electrolyte balance because their skin's ability to hold in the water isn't there anymore and literally fluids just drip out of the person so we have to worry about fluid and, elect and electrolyte balance
prevents infection. The skin, as well as the other membranes of the body, like the mucous membranes, um, they prevent stuff from getting from one side of the membrane to the other side of the membrane. And obviously, you don't want stuff that lives out here, like bacteria and viruses, to get into the, to the tissues underneath. So the skin protects us from infection by being a barrier to the bugs getting in. So it prevents infection. Protection from trauma. It may not seem, seem like a huge deal, but if, if something hits my arm here, for example, bam, the skin would take the initial brunt of that hit, and it wouldn't damage the bicep muscle underneath, or maybe any nerves passing by underneath. Um, this is especially protective in areas where we have more fat, and it's one of the reasons that I say women are tougher than men because women have a little bit more adipose tissue in their skin and they can take a hit a little bit better because of that. Another piece of evidence for this in terms of um, having a little bit of extra weight being protective from trauma, um, middle-aged men who have a spare tire have been shown to survive accidents better than men of middle age that don't have the spare tire, that are just skinny guys. The seat belt is more likely to cause internal injuries if there's not a good bit of fat in the way, you could say. Another cool piece of evidence for that, um, when you do archaeology on um, bones from uh, men who were um, gladiators, back when Rome had big gladiators that fought each other, those guys don't, don't actually look like, uh, like in the movies, like Russell Crowe all buff and ready to kill. Um, they actually looked more like sumo wrestlers. They were big, fat dudes. And again, that nice adipose tissue layer protects them from trauma, or protected them from trauma. I guess the other side to that is being a little bit overweight is not always a bad thing. So protection from trauma. What am I missing here? Protection from trauma. Um, other forms of assault. And this is going to be a big one when we talk about um, when we talk about skin color. Radiation, electromagnetic radiation. The skin is the first thing that those rays are going to hit, um, so the skin protects the underlying tissues from that radiation. I'm going to erase to give myself some more room. Another major job, vitamin D production. And I'm always reminded of this when I mention the radiation because ultraviolet radiation um, hitting the skin helps us to make vitamin D. And it's actually one of the major reasons for the great variation that we see in human skin color. If your ancestors lived in an area where there's not much UV radiation, they, were, they didn't need as much protection from UV radiation, but they needed the UV radiation to make vitamin D. So usually what you'll see is less pigmentation in populations that live in areas like that. Whereas if your ancestors came from an area where there was lots of UV radiation, then you would see more pigmentation in order for protection from that potentially mutating radiation. Um, and again, you get plenty of UV radiation to make the vitamin D in that case. So you get two evolutionary drives, protection from radiation and the protection of vitamin D, and that leads to an, a cool variation as long as there's variation of UV hitting the planet. I think that may be it, or at least it may be enough. Protection from trauma, protection from radiation, and vitamin D production. Um, oh, I know what I'm forgetting. Control of body temperature. You might not think of the skin as being important for controlling body temperature, but 
it is the largest um, surface of your body. In other words, your skin covers the entire outside of your body, so it's kind of your body's interface with the outside world. The skin determines how much heat we release from the body, how much goes out into the environment, and how much is retained inside of the body. The major way this happens is the dilation of blood vessels or the constriction of blood vessels. And of course, sweating can help get rid of more heat if we really need to. So control of body temperature is another thing that the skin does. Um, another one that's not often thought of in this way is communication. Communication in terms of your skin can tell your body what is on its surface if something touches you. Um, but also communication in terms of if, I, if my face gets red, that communicates to other people either that I'm angry or that I'm overheated because the dilation of blood vessels to let go of more heat, that kind of communication. And if you think of somebody who can't hear or can't, and, and can't see at the same time, like Helen Keller, obviously she had to communicate through her skin because she didn't have any other avenue, really. I think that's all the major reasons that we have skin. And for my students, as long as you get the major points for why we have one, and a few of these major points of, um, excuse me, what it is, and then major points about why we have one, you should have that essay question covered. As always, if there's any questions or comments, please let me know. And thank you once again for watching.